conducting an interview with Mr. William Edwards Andrews at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Andrews was born on September 9th, 1923. My name is Marilyn Parr and I'll be conducting the interview. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Andrews. Uh, I like to be called Ed instead of Mr. Andrews. Uh, I'm a retired lawyer and I get away from all that uh, stiff collar, necktie, formal things now. I'm enjoying life. Good. Could you tell us a little bit about where you were born and a little bit about your childhood growing up? Well, I was born in a little Tacoa mountain town in North Georgia. Uh, my dad came to uh, Atlanta in the legislature when I was two years old and my family moved here later and uh, we lived in Atlanta for all my life and uh, I practiced law in Atlanta for 35 years. I, I am really a native Atlanta, Atlantian because uh, I lived here except for the first two years of my life and uh, I feel right at home here. And, now that I'm retired, uh, I've moved just outside the limits uh, to Vinings, Georgia, just across the Chattahoochee River. And uh, we built us a house over there, and we were very happy because we got all the benefits of Atlanta without the traffic and the hustle and bustle. But we love Atlanta. So growing up when you were younger, the war broke out. How old were you when the war broke out? I don't remember how old I was. I remember I was about 18 when I volunteered, but I volunteered as soon as my family wouldn't say amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you volunteered then in May of 1943. Do you remember where you were in Pearl Harbor? You would have been about 18, 16? I was, um, uh, I remember that uh, I couldn't get a drink in a bar. I was a naval officer, but I couldn't get a drink in a bar because I wasn't old enough. <laughs> uh, I, I uh, volunteered here in Atlanta. Uh, uh, I went to Columbia Midshipman School in New York for a three-day, 90-day wonder course, which I admired tremendously. They, I didn't realize how important it was and we well I did realize because we all realized how important it was and we all were desperately trying to learn as much as fast as we could. We sensed the urgency of it. And so we got navigation and meteor meteorology and celestial navigation, damage control, gunnery, all that uh, and they call us 98 Wonders. I think it's a wonder that we gathered as much good information. And uh, able to, as we later proved, we had later used it very well. Then we got uh, went to uh, Little Creek, Virginia, where we got sea training. Uh, they already knew what kind of ship we were going to be on, and so they put us on those ships, and we uh, learned how to operate them and land them and uh, do all the necessary things. So, and that was concentrated day and night. And uh, so my uh, education was handled by real experts beautifully. And I admire the, what the Navy did. Uh, they prepared us very well. You I said, can't believe it. You said that you were, you were born and raised in the mountains. What made a mountain boy decide to go into the Navy? <laughs> Truth of the matter is, my father was in World War I, and he was in the Navy. And I admired him so much that there was any doubt in my mind that I also wanted to be in the Navy. So when you joined up, you knew Navy was the, the service that you were going to go into? Yes. And your parents' reaction to that? They were pleased. They didn't, they didn't want to see me go away, but they were pleased that I joined the Navy. Could you give us an idea? You mentioned the training and how in-depth it was. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of when you first arrived, did you have any sense of how much training and what was a typical day like in the beginning? Well, the beginning was just like the end. Uh, you arose at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning on the double time all day long uh, from one class to, to another. Uh, and there was no frills. Uh, you, uh, studied hard. You, at night, you carried your books home. <laughs> you carry them home. You carry them back to the dormitory uh, because you only had a limited time to do your studying at night because you had lights out. During all that, they gave us uh, a great uh, uh, 
course in physical fitness and so forth. So they, it was a well-rounded, power-packed course, and uh, we were all anxious to, to 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 succeed. When we first arrived, they said we were in formation. They said, "Look to your right. Now look to your left." He says, "One of you won't be here after the first 30 days." <laughs> Did you find that to be true? Yes. And so, uh, fortunately, I was not one of those. It was not not that later. But uh, I have nothing but admiration for the way it was set out and the way they did it. And uh, we knew we wanted, it and we were trying to fit the fit the bill. The sense that you had then, it's May 1943, and then later after you're going through the training, what was your sense then of how the war was going and your part in it? Where Did you know that you would be going to the Pacific at that point? We felt that we were. Uh, we didn't know it, and we were prepared to go wherever they sent us, but we all felt like we were headed for the Pacific uh, and the war with Japan. Uh, the war in uh, Europe uh, was still very much in, in force, in effect, and, uh, but uh, we felt like we were going to be needed in, in the Pacific, and it turned out we were right. Uh, and how were you notified? What was it like the day, the day that you were given your location, when you were actually leaving? You're leaving the States. This is 90 days after training, or? Well, we had 90 days of training, and then we had about three weeks of sea training in Chesapeake Bay, at, out from uh, Little Creek, Virginia, where we really learned how to handle the ship that we were going to be taking over. Uh, so uh, it was well-rounded. So you left from Virginia. Can you tell us the route where, once you left Virginia, can you tell us a little bit about the steps along the way? Where did you go, and did you go through the Panama? We took a train in cross country. It was a beautiful train. It's a troop train. And uh, little towns that come aboard and, and bring us coffee and sandwiches and so forth. People were so very hospitable. Uh, when we got to the Rocky Mountains, I'd never seen the Rocky Mountains. And they took off the steam engine. Back then, of course, we were on a train like that. Wabash Cannonball, you know, <laughs> and uh, put on an electric train. I, I, I think it was because it was more powerful because we went over the most beautiful ranges of mountains and it was snowing. I, being an old southern boy, I hadn't seen a lot of snow and I looked at that window and I thought, this is un this believe unbelievable. And so it was a very pleasant trip uh, out to the west coast. To uh, We went first to Portland, Oregon. Uh, where they were building our ship, they were finishing the ship. They were in the final stages of construction, and we stayed in. I stayed in the St. Francis Hotel. I, after all the dormitory and military life, there I was, and uh, I was in the St. Francis Hotel, and everything. Was done, and I was on per diem, which meant I could go to any restaurant in town. I, I thought I've died and gone to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> How long of a time period were you waiting? I, you know, things run together in my mind. I, I think about a month, uh, and then the, uh, every day though, we would go down to the shipyard and inspect our ship, and uh, I was at that time a communications officer, and I was checking the equipment and everything, and, and supplies were coming on ship, on board the ship from big tractor trailers, and we were checking it off, making sure they they furnished us what uh, we were uh, entitled to, and it was a very happy, pleasant time. And were there other? So you saw other ships also in the shipyard going through the same stages as your own? Well, uh, not. I was the only ship. Our ship was the only ship in that particular shipyard. But right across the harbor was another shipyard, and they were building a similar type ship. And what what kind of ship was yours? It was a amphibious ship, and I'd like to show you a picture of it. Sure, please do. I'm very proud <coughs> of this little ship. It's 152 feet long, and 
it's um, it was it was then the smallest seagoing ship in the navy, that is fighting ship, and uh, it was specially constructed for a special need in the Pacific. The, the war in the Pacific was primarily on the islands occupied by the Japanese. We were in the process of. of uh, I want to point out several things here. This little ship doesn't, you can't tell much from this, but this little 152 sh foot ship has three quad forties, uh, three quad forties, one there, another one there, and another one there. That shoots a real good sized projectile. Then we had four 20 millimeters and two 50 calibers. We had more firepower per ton than a battleship. We also fired from the front rockets. Uh, we could fire uh, 120 rockets per minute. And uh, the ship, I want to brag on my ship a little bit. Tell us uh, the name of your ship. The name of your ship. My ship was, did not have a name. It was number 68, LCS 68. And my skipper's name was Lasig, L-E-S-S-I-G, -S -S and he was a great, great skipper. Uh, we fired rockets on Okinawa, and uh, it was a thing to behold. Uh, we had a tremendous anchor on the stern. We called it the fantail. And you drop this big anchor over, and it has a long cable, and you, that is when you're about 100, 100 yards offshore. And, that anchor is so that you can go in and touch shore and fire all these rockets and uh, you sew the rockets while you're underway just like planting. And then you uh, retract off of the shore and you then strafe the shore with your 40 millimeters, your 20 millimeters, your 50 millimeters. And the thing is so, and after respect, after thoughts, I think, that 90 days and that three weeks, they trained us to do all these things. And I can promise you that during our entire tour of duty, I don't know of a single ship. We went through three tornadoes. Uh, what do they call them out there? Uh, uh, typhoons. Typhoons. Went through t three typhoons. And that little ship would weather any kind of weather in the world. We learned that if you would catch those tremendous waves on your fantails, the navy phrase, on the tail of that ship, and go and ride with the wind. I try to fight that 70 and 80 mile an hour wind, ride with that wind. Uh, you could weather any kind of storm. And some of the major sh ships were not doing as well as we did. And it, uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm very thrilled about that ship, and the great thoughts went into it, and great training, because we got three weeks of training aboard that same type ship. Uh, the Navy took care of us all the way through. How many, how many men would be aboard a ship that size? 72 enlisted men and six officers. And we were all in the same boat. We were all... Literally. Little young fellows. <laughs> No, was was this this group of men the same men that you came over from Virginia with? You, did you travel as, as I mean as, as a group? Was the same men that you <coughs> yes. trained with? Yes. So tell we us were. a little bit about the, the the day that the ship is it's all ready. You're ready to leave. What was that like? And was there any kind of a send off? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, we had a formal. Uh, Ten minutes send off of the, uh, the trumpet sounding and the flag raising and a proclamation read, and uh, we went to sea. Did you go to sea alone, or were you part of a convoy? We were alone, and uh, there we were with our new ship and our new crew, and we were headed down the coast to San Diego, first stop. And, of course, every sailor has the last night ashore, and so we all, crew and everybody had them, not together, but all had the last night ashore, and we got out, went down the Portland River to the uh, Pacific Ocean, and everything was so pretty, and got down out to sea, and a real storm came up. And it was so rough, and we, uh, we were uneasy. We were on a new ship, and the first time in a storm, and 
and we were all sick, all of us would see sick, but uh, we learned that you can meet adversity head on and laugh about it and do it, and we did it, and we loved, we loved the Navy. And, uh, it was a, an exciting experience. And after that, we learned it in regards to what kind of weather we had. Uh, usually a storm wouldn't last more than three days. And, uh, we learned that the roughest time for the man was when he was on watch, and everybody had a watch, a uh, four-hour watch every night, uh, is at night time because you can't see the waves coming, and all of a sudden you're up and you're down, you're up and you're down, <laughs> and even the old salts. <laughs> we had some old sailors in there who'd been in the Navy for a long time, and they'd be just as sick as we were. But um, you don't die from it, and you know you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. So it was a bonding experience where we all met little hardships and we thought they were little hardships uh, and learned that we could survive them and our ship was proved itself to us it would respond perfectly and I want to say something else uh, we were at sea for two years all over the Pacific and that ship never had any problem with any problem at all. That thing was so reliable. I, I wish I knew who, who designed that ship because he, they did such a wonderful job. With that many men on it, it was like being on a submarine, uh, which that service I really admire. But uh, we were on the surface and I like that too. Uh, <clears throat> greatly, a beautifully designed ship that met, met every hazard and every need. We would we were designed to fight fire aboard other ships because at Okinawa the kamikazes were coming in and were getting a lot of our ships. And uh, we, we would go alongside. We had special firefighting equipment, we, like a f fire truck pulling up. And we would help that. And um, probably the most important duty we had uh, was on picket duty. And that little ship was just perfect for it. We were supposed to intercept and hopefully shoot down uh, the kamikazes that, and by the way, that comes to mind right often now because what with the terrorists doing the, uh, the the bombs carried in by children and old folks who are willing to die to explode that bomb because those Japanese were our first experience with kamikaze, uh, people willing to die to, to, to kill you. Um, but. Um, Oh, we were on picket duty, and we were uh, about 20 miles outside the harbor, and we were supposed to uh, intercept the Japanese, and we did, and we shot all of them down, not, my, not I nor my ship. We did do some shooting, and we did get one. Uh, uh, but if you didn't get them, uh, a lot of times they would select you to dive on because they were running out of gas, and we couldn't get into the main harbor. So one way or the other, we just stopped. <laughs> In any of these engagements, what would be some of the larger ones, your ship, and how many other ships would you see around you in a major engagement? Well, uh, on picket duty, that was the only type of engagement we had, other than landing troops. Uh, when you're landing troops, you see a lot of ships, you know, destroyers and kick cruisers and so forth, firing over your head. And later at Okinawa, uh, we, were, we were patrolling between the battleships, the old Arizona was out there. And they, as we came into Okinawa, here we were, never had seen any combat, or, uh, and we didn't know what to expect. And we could see these freight cars, uh, red hot freight cars, going through there, and hear these tremendous thunder-like explosions. Like, Good night, what in the world's going on here? <clears throat> and when we got closer, we saw there was our battleship supporting the Marines and the Army on Okinawa with 14-inch guns. <clears throat> And when they find those 14-inch guns, uh, those shells are red hot. And going through the air, it looks like an automobile going through the air red hot. And uh, while we were there, we had the duty of patrolling between the shore and the battleships to keep kamikaze boats and planes from coming in and uh, striking the battleship. Uh, if, if you got a little off course, uh, got too close, they, those shells would knock your mast off. <laughs> and when they would go, when they'd fire, our whole uh, ship would vibrate. But anyway, it was very exciting, uh, challenging. Uh, the the excitement of it was not was almost welcome to kill the boredom of uh, 
Uh, that that would get me go to show, go a show. You didn't, you didn't uh, go to shore. Did you go to Hawaii at all? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, we uh, we were in Hawaii for two weeks and did a little ship additional things and got radar on our ship at uh, Hawaii and. Uh, and later, after the war, we went to the Philippines and went ashore and played baseball and so forth. So, we, we Navy took care of us, but we, on the way out and for the year or so, we were out there. Uh, uh, it was a different way of life, <laughs> and not bad. Uh, uh. Well, there must have been times where there was a lot of activity and then lull time. What did you do That's during right. the lull time to? to <clears throat> you read, and or you played cribbage. Uh, later, uh, after the war, we we, we were in the, we were among the first ships that went ashore in Japan after the war, which was very exciting. Uh, we were so early ashore that we carried sidearms. We didn't know whether we were going to be fired on, and we would not eat the food. We didn't know whether we were going to be poisoned or not. But the Japanese were so glad to see us. They welcomed us like we were conquering heroes. The populace did. They were just really very polite and nice. <coughs> how and much, before you landed there, how much information did you have on leading up to that point about the bombs? Where were you when you heard about the atomic bombs? We were at anchor. Wait a minute, that was, we didn't know anything about the atomic bomb. We knew about when the, when the peace treaty was signed, and we all, you know, celebrated and shot the guns off and everything. But uh, we knew less about the course of the war and how things were going than uh, Mr. John I, public uh, back in the states. I was going to ask you that in terms of communication. So you didn't get a sense. You did you get a sense though? How how did you get a sense of how the war was going with the information you did have? Uh, <clears throat> we all thought it was going well, uh, but we did not get any details. We we knew less than uh, if you listen to WSB here in Atlanta. In Atlanta. But you you were getting closer and closer to Japan. You were progressing. Oh yeah, closer Okinawa was just uh, about sixty, about a hundred hundred miles off the coast. Of Japan. Now, did you, when and how did you hear the news then when FDR passed away? It was announced over the system there. And what was the sense oh, of it? Was, it was a very sad time. We, we, he was our president. I want to take you back to landing there in Japan because that must have been quite momentous. It was uh, <clears throat> not so momentous as uh, you kind of feeling your way. You didn't know what to expect. Um, they would send uh, an officer ashore with 10 or 15 troops, and you stayed together. Uh, you supervised it. They didn't go, go wandering off. And uh, after. Uh, uh, several trips ashore, you found out they weren't going to poison you, they weren't going to shoot at you, and so we got more relaxed. But uh, uh, it was, uh, they were still you know, uh, riding on rickshaws and charcoal burning taxi cabs. Uh, they weren't starving, but they were hungry. You know, children, instead of eating popsicles or hot dogs, were eating little Irish boiled orange potatoes like it was candy and they were just holding on to it very dearly. They weren't begging, they were proud people. Uh, I, I did not like them because we'd been fighting with them, but I admired them. How long did you stay in Japan? And do you recall what area of Japan you came ashore? Came ashore in, uh, in Tokyo. You could come up the, the river, the bay, right into the, the little harbor in Japan and step off the ship and walk right into Tokyo. Uh, we were there uh, for a while, and we were at Yokosuka and Yokosuka.
two naval ports. Uh, and after I was there for um, I think uh, seven or eight months, I, I lose track of time. Uh, and after we found out we were going to be welcomed and treated nicely, uh, uh, we, I'd get an overnight leave and I'd get on that fast electric train go 100 miles an hour and I could go down to Yo I was in Tokyo, I'd go to Yokosuka, Yokosuka, uh, on that too, I'd make sure I was going to be able to get back, you know, <laughs> on time. Uh, and always did, and those chains ran beautifully on time. Uh, and MacArthur was a great administrator. Uh, he didn't want to have any uh, undue circumstances uh, cause a world conflict, so uh, he knew he had Marines who uh, had been uh, in life and death battle with those folks, so the, every train had one or two cars set aside for Allied personnel. So we weren't pushing and shoving and, and uh, causing any kind. He was, uh, and they thought he was a god. I, I got, uh, got a show on. And I was walking by his headquarters, and you could tell his headquarters was in a big, long black car with all the stars and everything on it. And uh, when a Japanese man would walk by there, he'd bow to that car. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Uh, anybody any, in Japanese wanted you to do anything that uh, you didn't want to do, so you'd say, Mac Arthur, no, like that. And that was the end of it. I mean, it's, it's the God had spoken. That just ended that conversation. There was no more demands made for anything like that. But uh, my government was very much in control of things. Can you tell us a little bit about what you saw as you traveled around Japan, the rebuilding? Well, to an old Navy man, the f most interesting thing was the public baths. And the beautiful men and women and children all in there. If you walk by, it'd be a hundred people in there bathing. <laughs> and we just couldn't believe it. It's so different, so oriental. Um, never any uh, hanky panky or petting or anything like that. It was a um, it was a public uh, nicety, something that everybody did, and it was um, so well received and so well handled. Uh, uh, a lot of. Damaging. Well, we had done a great job of bombing them, but uh, they were busy uh, building back. And uh, the uh, little children were happy, and they finally found out we were bearers of candy bars. And they really loved that, but they didn't run up and beg for them. The Japanese people were very proud. They were so pleased when you offered it to them. But Nobody did at any time begged for anything. Uh, <clears throat> uh, during during this whole time period that you were in the service, how often did you communicate with home? Oh, I'm I'm sure that I wrote uh, two or three letters a week and got two or three letters back, but some they'd be a week or two old. Uh, my mother. <laughs> I was her little boy, uh, sent me a camera. And on the mail bag, big canvas bag, came aboard the ship, we got on. Down at the bottom was this, cam it was this camera just lying out <laughs> in the middle of all the debris. And I picked it up and set it aside. And I got my letter, said I have enclosed it in a box a camera to so and so and so and so. Well, that was my camera. That was the only camera we had aboard ship until we got to Japan. And you could buy them there. Uh, and I got pictures of the islands and some of the uh, foxholes and so forth. But, uh, uh, and of my, of my crew. And that, was, that, was a, that camera was a great hit. You're the unofficial photographer. <laughs> right. Did you still retain most of those pictures today? Yes, yes. And did you, this gets personal, but did you have a sweetheart at all during any of this time? Oh, yes. Um, I was gone so long till I don't know what happened, but I got letters from her and I wrote for a lock of her hair. And I remember I got that lock of her hair and a little blonde George sweetheart, you know, oh, it smells so good, and I said, listen, and we corresponded regularly, but then the letters got fewer and far between. 
I don't really, not any breaking point, just uh, distance and time. But uh, yes, I, I, uh, I had several nice young ladies writing me and my parents writing me, so I was well taken care of. You mentioned, was it after Japan that you went to the Philippines? Yes. Uh, no, no, it was before. We went to, when the Battle of Okinawa was over, we went to the Philippines, and that was something to behold. Uh, uh, the, the war officially in the Philippines had been won, and it um, was over, but we was, we were, we, we weren't told, but anybody could recognize, the ships were coming in by the hundreds, mustering, gathering for the invasion of Japan. And that was one of the most awesome sights I've ever seen, one of the most inspiring sights. I mean, not just a hundred or a thousand, but as far as I can see, big ships, warships, tankers, every kind of ship. We, our government was getting these folks ready to, to hit Japan, and that's right, while we were there, I'm sure, they sent us out to be a part of that invasion, that's what we did, and uh, so, uh, the Lord took care of us, I, uh, I, I, I resented the, the, the people who opposed the dropping of the bomb, the bombs, the two of them, but uh, those bombs saved hundreds of thousands of personnel, because those Japanese would have, I had already seen how they fought. And they would have taken a terrible toll on us going ashore. We would have won, we would have won, but it would have been a very heavy price. And I mean, everything was ready to go until they, they surrendered. So your ship was already on the way as part of an invasion force? They didn't tell us that, but we were. Yes. So there must have this sense of relief you, you mentioned. Oh, before. yes. Yes. <clears throat> Some of the islands, I, I was not in this one, in the Iwo Jima, we sent 11 of our ships in and 10 of them were sunk by the Japs, who were very good. In Okinawa, uh, we did a little bit better, but uh, I was very relieved we didn't have to go in. So when your tour of duty is over, was when you were in Japan, and tell us about coming back home. Well, it was a, one of the saddest times in the world. <laughs> My ship that I'd seen here, yeah, that I'd seen combat on, and become bonded with the crew and the skipper, and uh, weathered a lot of good and bad times, uh, got orders to come back to the States. And oh, we were so happy. They said, but we want to increase ensign to a Lieutenant JT, JG. <laughs> junior grade and put him on another ship to stay there for a while. Oh, good night. I, I think I'm sure the tears <laughs> rolled down my cheek. I went back to the fantail, the stern of the ship, and watched my ship pull out and wave to them, and I just, I could just feel the tears running down my cheek. But the good news is I was only delayed maybe a month or two and came back uh, on an LCI as an executive officer, a big shot, and uh, bonded with that crew, and everything was fine. So all my experiences were good. Where did you, when you came back to the States, what, what area, what city did you come into? San Diego. And we had shipped out from San Diego, and uh, we had we were held so long. I never have understood this at anchor outside before we could come in and dock and unload until the war was over and people had forgotten about the war, and I, uh, all the American flags and the bands were, had already had that time of exhilaration and. Uh, I mean, I got, got ashore. Nobody said hello or anything. I don't know. I remember a bus and rode into San Diego and did some sightseeing. Uh, but it was happy because uh, I knew that I was headed home. And I, oh, it was, yeah, I, 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 uh, 
I enjoyed San Diego. It was a beautiful town. The war was over and people were happy and people were very nice and uh, differential. Was there anything that, that seemed really different to you? You'd been there two years earlier. Anything seemed like it had changed? Or people had changed? What was mm, oh, yes. People were lighthearted and gay and uh, singing. And, uh, uh, the mood was so much happier and uh, more exhilarated, exhilarating. Uh, yes, very definite. Very good question. Uh, the mark changed, uh, changed for the good. Other, before we were all, you know, you were up against a tough proposition. Everybody was pulling together. And that's one thing that I think about. And, and during World War II, we were so supported by our country and our newspapers, our news media. Uh, we're at war now. And people don't realize it, and we don't support our troops. We don't. Many of us do, but the newspaper, the news media, always harping on the embarrassing things. And I am concerned that we are not united like we should be, because we are at war, and we're going to be at war uh, with this uh, monomania that's. In the Middle East is going to be, have to be dealt with, and, uh, and they have their kamikazes, and they're just as effective as the Japanese, and I know that's a very tough enemy. Did you ever, since the war ended, have a chance to go back? Did you, had you been to Japan or the Philippines or any of the islands? No. Um, my wife, Jan, whom I've been married for 35 years, uh, she says, Ed, I don't understand it. I offered to go with you to Japan. Uh, she said, it looks like you'd want to go back and see it. And I, uh, I don't. We travel a lot. We've been to the Philippines. And, and um, I did go out and look at the old sunken battleship and all that. But, uh, and we loved the, uh, the outer islands. Uh, that was wonderful to enjoy it, and we, we've traveled a lot. In fact, we travel more than anybody I know. Uh, By boat? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we get along so well, and we travel so well, and Jan gets, right now, she's back uh, reading her travel books and making plans. For, we're going to Canada, but we don't just go to Canada, we, we drive. And uh, we're going up the East Coast. We're going to stop in Maine for to see some real sights and, and uh, New Hampshire for, for first. And uh, then we're going to go on up and do sightseeing and so forth. End up at the place where we've been for four or five times at Mount Pilatus. And uh, our children are going to come up and spend a week with us, uh, the second week we're there. And so it's. Uh, great time together and I'm enjoying my country. Take me back to um, coming home and what you decided to, to do with your life after the war. There's never any doubt at all. I wanted to be a lawyer. I came back and instead of just finishing up my AB degree at the University of Georgia, I <clears throat> at that time I could go to law school early while I was before I'd gotten my AB degree. And I got a, and a real push-up, double-up uh, situation where I studied law during the regular school year and finished up my A.B. degree in the summer, going to summer school. And it was great. I really worked and concentrated on my law and kind of relaxed and enjoyed the liberal arts during the summer. And it was a great deal. Uh, had plenty of time to go up to the mountains and relax and so forth on the weekend. But that was never in doubt I wanted to be a lawyer. And so I was set about it as soon as I got back, and the GI Bill took care of me beautifully. So you did use the, the GI Bill? Oh, yes. Got, a, <clears throat> got both degrees. Pleasure of Uncle Sam. And that was the University of Georgia? Mm -hmm. And then you came to Atlanta to practice law? Yes. We were... Uh, 
the meantime, my parents had, they were living in Atlanta, and I'd, you know, I'd lived in Atlanta for, since I was two years old, so yes, I came back to Atlanta, and I practiced law in Atlanta. Can you tell us a little bit about when you met your wife? <laughs> Well, I thought I was a big shot. I had two gold stripes on my sleeve, and I was, I felt like I was, well, pretty tall. <laughs> and she was a little coy at Georgia. And uh, her older sister was, was, was a sweetheart of Sigma Chi uh, the year before. And uh, the phone rang, and I answered. She said, "Ed, this is Eddie. This is Mary Sue. I said, Mary Sue, how is the sweetheart of Sigma Chi?" She said, "We carry on." She says, "My baby sister's coming uh, to Atlanta this weekend. Would you like to carry on?" I said, "I sure would." <laughs> oh, what a lighthearted time! And I did. And she was Bobby Socks and long skirt and Miss, uh, you know, Miss Miss Coed. And I thought she was so young. And so <clears throat> I said, "What do you do with a girl like this, a child like this?" She says, "Actually, she's not that much younger than I was." <laughs> I felt like she was. So I said, "Well, let's go out to the naval officers club." All right. So we went out there. And of course, I was a member of being a formal naval officer, the United States Navy officer. <laughs> and they gave me the salute, and I thought this already is impressing her. So we got there, and I said, uh, well, look at all these slot machines. I said, they're all rigged, so they make so very little profit. It's mostly fell on We want to play the slot machines? Huh? She said, oh, I don't gamble. I said, oh. And uh, I said, well, uh, here's the bar, and the drinks here are just 25 cents. I said, the things are so great. I can, uh, I can well afford that. I didn't say that to her. Uh, she said, oh, I don't drink. I said, Phew. Uh, I said, well, look, I know the roast beef here is great. Let's have dinner and dance. And, oh, I do both of those. We met, and that was the beginning. Uh, her sister, Mary Sue, lives one house down from us and is, uh, is a widow now, and uh, she's remained very close, and we, we love Mary Sue, and it's uh, been a great. And children? I have two beautiful daughters who are both married and uh, have given me, well, one's given me three grandchildren and the other one's given me two grandchildren and they all live within walking distance. And we uh, spend a lot of wonderful time together with them. Jan is known as Go-Go because she's always taking me off to Canada, to Europe or someplace. I enjoy her. Um, and I'm, the, I'm, I'm daddy daddy, because I'm the daddy. And we have grown up with, with that children. And your daughters and your grandchildren's names? <laughs> My daughter is Mary Sue uh, uh, Curry. And uh, her oldest boy is Andrew Curry, named for me. And her youngest boy is Smith Curry. And I'm very close to him too. And the um, newest one is uh, a little baby boy, and his is Edward Andrews Carey. And uh, Dallas uh, Allison uh, 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 is my youngest daughter, and she has a uh, two beautiful children that I've spent a lot of time with, and. Uh, get to be with that those children just as much as uh, I do with the others, and it's a great life. We're just about wrapping up. Are there any last words or any other recollections you'd like to put on tape? I'd like to say to my country, muster up, face facts, and let's row the boat together. Thank you very much.